Okay, class. I'm just curious, does anyone have any questions at this point in time about what we covered so far? Any questions? Maybe you're not sure on something? Yeah, we'll start down the front. We'll just grab a microphone that way. The people at home will be able to hear the question. Yeah, just talking about interaction. Uh -huh. I noticed with a lot of these um, seminars, you get people to massage each other. Uh -huh. That would be that would come under. That's another form. So in your content, if you're doing a longer presentation, um, then you're going to add into it. Uh, it depends on your presentation. If it's a half an hour, an hour, hour and a half, you may not incorporate that. But if it's going to be like a day or, or several days, then you can certainly add extra things in. So you incorporate. Um, depends on the audience, how warm the audience is. Okay, in a corporate audience, I probably wouldn't recommend getting them to massage each other. Uh, they might do the runner, but. Um, <laughs> You can certainly do that. It just breaks up also what you're doing, getting people physically involved and because people can only sit for so long. So one of the comments I often hear by people when they hear that uh, my seminars might go for four days and some nights they don't finish at 1 a.m. You know, later, how do you keep an audience enthralled and engaged for four days uh, when most people get bored after half an hour? But it's doing some of those processes, getting the physiology changed, people moving the physiology, it awakens them up, they feel more refreshed and then they can take in more information. So there's a method to the madness of doing that. In bigger seminars what you can also incorporate is games and exercises. Um, because you've got more time, you can get that way you can create team experiences, people can learn more by interaction, so you can add games and exercises to a presentation, especially if it's going to be a longer presentation for a day or two days, and that will break it up a lot, and also makes it more interactive learning, so it's not just uh, theory being taught from stage, it's people actually learning from some of those, so you do exercises and games that actually create lessons for people, and uh, I'm sure if you Google uh, on Google you find pretty much anything, but that you'd look up um, games for presentations or something like that, you'd be able to find a lot of different games that are done or, or exercise done in seminar formats that you could pick and choose and test whether that relates to the message that you want to get across to people. Um, but yeah, no, it's a good question. You can do that. So it's another form of, of when you get people to turn to the person next to them and teach something, it's another way to expand on that, that, that breaking up the content. Yep, question behind there, yep. Um, Jamie, in terms of, you know, when you, I know it probably wouldn't happen to you, um, and that you have difficult audiences or you can sense that, what are the sort, of, what are the sorts of things that you then do to break that pattern? Sure, okay, so it's who also has the fear that you might get some hecklers or difficult audience, who has that fear, and, and that's a, a warranted fear that can happen. Um, there's a few things you can do. By doing this 10-step process, by challenging the audience, etc., you're taking control of the audience. So very rarely will it happen if you take control of it. Uh, it can happen though, so it depends on your audience. If you're talking to a cold audience uh, and you don't pre-frame them well enough and if you don't challenge them well enough and you don't do the interaction, then it definitely can, can happen. Uh, it's very rarely happened to me. Um, but I can remember um, many years ago when I was doing what I call cold audience and doing a lot of introductory seminars and using mediums such as radio advertising where for whatever reason that medium attracted people that, you know, some of them weren't really, I don't know why they were there, uh, why they bothered coming. Um, but generally if you're talking on a topic and you're doing mass marketing for people to come into the general public, you are open to hecklers or, or people that um, may not, uh, they, they may have an image of you that's not, you know, you're the devil or something like this or, or uh, anti-materialistic people that, you know, think you're, a, you know, you, your God is money or something. There's people out there that might have all opposing views. Uh, but generally those people won't come to a seminar because negative people drives them nuts to be in a seminar that's a positive environment. They just can't handle it. But if they do, some may come with particular agen agendas. So I've only ever had a couple of experiences and the people that caused trouble were sent there by individuals with a deliberate agenda to cause trouble. Okay, so for most of you that won't happen. Okay, um, but that was easy to handle. Because if anyone's, if you in charge the audience, anyone that's foolish enough in the audience to think they can take on a speaker that knows how to control the audience, they just send themselves up for mass embarrassment. Um, because you can use the audience against them. So in this case, there's a couple of people stood up. I was teaching about um, property strategy on how property statistically in Australia in the past had doubled every seven to ten years, saying that not all properties will, some areas won't, etc. And two people stood up in the second row with a book saying, uh, that's not true, properties won't double in ten years, etc. And like in the middle of the whole audience. Um, and I thought that was interesting. So, but I can cl they had a clear agenda there, so they were there just to disrupt the seminar. And uh, I, said, I said, well, 
as I said, not all properties will. I, I don't, I'm not here to, I'm just backing on statistics. This is what's happened in the past. You can do all your own research. But uh, let me ask you a question. I said, first of all, uh, can I make it clear? I don't need to be here. I'm volunteering my time um, to share very valuable information. And uh, I'm only going to do that if, if I have commitment from people in the room that are actually committed to, to wanting to be here. Can I get a show of hands in the audience here? Who is actually committed and, and wants to learn more about these strategies? Put your hands up. Okay, so 99% of the room do, except for you know, 500 people, except for these two people. So you imagine how they're feeling right now. So say, look, I'm prepared to teach for those. If you don't want to be here, if there's anyone here that doesn't want to be here or doesn't see value in this, uh, you're welcome to leave. You don't have to be here. And actually, I think now might be a good, when might now be a good time to leave if you're in that situation? <laughs> so you're keeping rapport, you're being respectful, but you're putting pressure on them. I say, you know, if you, if you want to check out anything I'm saying, check out the facts, etc. I'm not here to, uh, I'm just telling you how it is. You know, whether you like it or not, that's not my problem. Whether you do anything with it, that's your, your choice. I don't really care. I'm a millionaire from property, uh, whether you go out and buy any property. So whether you do it or not is irrelevant to me. It doesn't affect my financial future. So you're just clarifying that. So once you're doing, all you're doing is getting the audience recommitted again. So you're challenging, you know, I'm prepared to ded dedicate my time for those who are willing to um, be committed and uh, to, to putting the time in. And most of the audience will be like that. Make sense? So that was the only instance I can remember. Um, but I think part of that, if you do these processes up front, you pre-frame the audience well, you've challenged the audience, you've in done the interaction, you own the audience, then it's very likely to happen. Because, uh, you, and also you respect and acknowledge the audience up front. So there may be some people who may get people that feel they know more than you in the audience. And that can happen. So the danger what some presenters do is this, is I've seen this happen a lot even in our industry, is out of ego presenters will want to, um, because they might know there might be some very sophisticated investors, let's say it's an investment seminar, and there might be some sophisticated investors in the room, like really multi, multi millionaires. So they, what they'll try and do is start teaching more and more advanced strategies so that they, they, they are creating that they know more than the sophisticated investors, which is a really dumb thing to do because then they're just losing most of the audience because most of the audience is not sophisticated. So what you can do is just respect that right up front. I also respect there may be some people in this room here today as an example that are already incredibly successful at this particular strategy. And, and uh, I just want to acknowledge that. I know there's also others here that are just starting out and never done anything. So you just want to acknowledge where everyone's at. And those who are already, you know, maybe even be multi-millionaires already, um, I, you, know, you may just be here because you've become successful because you know these finer distinctions that led you to greater success. So you may, may just be here to fine tune a few things. So what you're doing is you're taking the egos out of the room. You're, the way you do it, you're acknowledging the egos in the room. Okay. And, and just following on from that, in terms of, um, you know, a one-hour presentation versus a, a, th a two-hour or a three-hour presentation. Uh -huh. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, please, in terms of, you know, what, a, what you should be looking at and what you, shouldn't, you should not be looking at? Okay, as far as, like, if you're doing a short presentation versus, Correct. you know, maybe an hour or, you know, an hour and a half versus maybe a day presentation or, yeah. or et cetera. Um, the main difference is what I talked about before. If you're doing a longer presentation, now, every, you've got to take this into... Um, context, there are some presentations you may do, you're dealing to a warm audience. So if it's going to be a long presentation, like a day or two, it's generally people that are pre-committed to be there and you're the main presenter for that period of time, that would probably be a warm audience. Or people that have come for a particular agenda, so they chose to be there or paid to be there. Or if it's a corporate type presentation, they have been sent there by their boss, that's a different scenario. Corporates can be um, much more difficult, okay, because they don't want to be there. Um, they're only there because they're told to go there and they're, they're the ones that will be you know, more difficult to deal with. But you can still deal with them anyhow. Okay? Um, you just got to be a lot more in their face. Okay? Politely, but a lot more in their face. Um, so the main things you do, so if it's a dedicated seminar, let's say you're running a two-day seminar, well, people are probably paid to be there or whatever the arrangement is. And um, so they're, they're, already, they're much more committed audience. In that case, you are going to add in exercises and games. You're going to put activities into it. You might do the massage breaks depending on the, the context. You're going to add more of that into it. You're going to break the day up. You might bring in guest speakers, etc. so it breaks it up. You're going to give those breaks. So that's going to be a different scenario. If you're doing a 30-minute presentation like to a group of investors or in, to a, a corporate environment or like in the company you work for or to sell a product uh, that you're pitching, then that's a completely different context because one, it's probably, it may not be a cold audience, 
but you've got a much shorter outcome. So you have less time, so you have to be much more concise and go you know, straight to what the outcome is much quicker. Okay? But otherwise, you still the same 10 steps, though, is still going to be in, in any presentation. So that part doesn't change. It's just you're going to, in a longer presentation, you expand it and you add in some exercise, you break it up, maybe some guest speakers and uh, things like that. That's probably about the only difference. Other than who's your audience. Yep. Another question? Yep. Yeah, Adam here. Hi, Adam. Uh, just wondering how uh, techniques that you use to remember your story and, and keep it flowing, so rather than referring to notes and just the professionalism. Yeah, sure. It's, it's a very good question. And so this is what we're going to get into now as far as what should we do um, before your presentation. The 10 steps we've gone through is how to deliver a presentation. What you need to do is before that is create your presentation uh, and be prepared. So what I do is two things. Now, jot this down. Obviously, there's PowerPoint. So a lazy man's presentation is PowerPoint. In other words, with PowerPoint, you, it's a fallback. So you'll see most presenters will use PowerPoint. I call it lazy because um, it's a lazy way to do it. I very rarely use PowerPoint. For a presentation like I've only ever done this presentation once four years ago, um, so I'm using a bit more PowerPoint. Okay, because I've been, I just not say, if you've done a seminar over and over again, it comes off the top of your head, you know what you're doing pretty much. Whether it's a brand new seminar, like I did on Saturday, I use a bit more PowerPoint. But even then, I prefer not to use PowerPoint. I think it's much more engaging if you're free flowing. Okay? Um, but PowerPoint, you can use as part of it. And certainly when you're building a presentation, you're, certainly, you're most likely going to be doing a PowerPoint. Okay? But that doesn't mean you have to rely on it completely. Um, but you, that would be one way as a backup. As far as what I do outside of that, I also have my cheat notes. Okay, so my cheat notes will be, um, I will create a presentation this way. Everyone's different uh, how you do it, but this is what I would do is basically like a PowerPoint. Sometimes I will do a PowerPoint that's for the audience, and I'll create my, a separate PowerPoint, which is my cheat notes, which is just for me. Okay. So, and sometimes you may have, if you're doing bigger seminars, you may have two monitors. One is your cheat notes, and one is what's on the screen which might be the PowerPoint, or if you're using video camera, often you're projected on the screen and, and, and the AV operators will cross between um, what you're writing maybe on a flip chart and they'll cross back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so often I'll have two PowerPoints. So I'll create my cheat notes in a power, PowerPoint format, or I won't do it my, personally myself. Um, but otherwise, when I'm creating a presentation, I will do this. So if I'm thinking a new presentation, I'll just get a piece of paper and I'll draw boxes on that piece of paper representing each one represents a PowerPoint slide. And that's how I will do my cheat notes. So I might have three or four pages like that um, as an example. So, which is effectively a PowerPoint. So here I might have notes scribbled on here as an example, which is drawn in like a PowerPoint. Okay. So, and all it does for myself, as you're saying, Adam, like you know, you don't want to always be referring or reading, etc. Is you're going back. I have this just as a backup. Not so much of a backup, but it reminds me of key points I do want to cover. So every time people are interacting, I can check that and go, okay, I want to make sure I cover this or don't forget that. So it's a way to, to help you not to forget things that you definitely want to cover. But it's different to you're doing a lecture and you're just reading you know, 20 pages of a pre-scripted word by word. I mean, there's nothing worse than someone just standing up there reading that when they're not really into it. Um, so... They're triggers. In other words, they're triggers. So it also gives you peace of mind that you have your cheat notes to fall back on. So in case you, uh, especially in the beginning, you freak out and say, like, I've run out of things to say, I can't remember what to say, you can refer back to your cheat notes. And that's why a PowerPoint is a lazy man's way to do a presentation because um, worst case, you can just start reading the presentation. So you have, it's like a backup, a safety net. Making sense? And, uh, and that I'd recommend that in the beginning. And some people always do PowerPoint, but even if you're doing PowerPoint, don't just read the PowerPoint. Actually, really, it will trigger you to explain and go into the passionate part about the PowerPoint. So rather than, you know, if you've created the PowerPoint, you know the stuff. But if you're delivering someone else's PowerPoint and you've just been told to deliver, you really want to be prepared beforehand and actually understand what's on the PowerPoint and what it actually means and how you can convey that to the audience and why it's valuable. Otherwise, you're just reading information. And people can read a book if they want to do that. Okay? Does that make sense? So I will do, this is as simple as if I want to create a presentation, um, I'll just, when the ideas come to me, I'll just start doing this rough, out roughly on a few pages. I'll just hand it to my... Um, web design team or you know, whoever, and they'll put it into a PowerPoint and there's a presentation. Okay? Um, so it can be that simple. So as things flow. But rarely when I'm doing a presentation, often 
you know, the joke always is I don't even follow what's on the PowerPoint, okay? Especially if it's a presentation I've done a lot of before. It might be there, but rarely do I even follow it. Because you get on a tangent and you just go through so it just comes naturally. So that will come as you get more practice on something and you get more skillful at it. It'll just flow. But then the cheat notes trigger you to keep on track of what you definitely want to cover. What's the clear outcomes, etc. So in particular, what my cheat notes will have is what the preframes are. So any beginning presentation will be preframes. The challenges are listed for myself. So what challenge do I want to have unless they're just standard challenges. Uh, key points I want to cover. Uh, that will all be on there. Okay, and uh, I'll just space it out like that. That works well for me. That's not hard to do. Okay, so in the beginning, I'd recommend PowerPoint is is as a backup. Okay, yep. Take some more questions. Just down the front, we'll just get a microphone for you. Hi, Jamie. Steve here. Hi, Steve. Uh, Jamie, um, stage presence and how you hold yourself on stage. Yep. How you visualize or talk or visual have visual contact with people what's the tricks there or what do you recommend there sure okay so what you can jot down is a very good question so you probably heard this before so jot this down that as far as what is communication only seven percent of communication is actually words only seven percent so you can see why if someone's just doing a lecture and just reading a scripted material it's not effective communication because words are only seven percent there's no passion in it. There's no really uh, conveying why they should listen, what's the benefit of this. Um, so it's just words. 38% is actually tonality. 38% of communication is actually tonality. So if I give you an example of this might be if I said, um, I love you. Versus if I said, I love you. Same words. Is there a different communication? Okay. It's different tonality, different communication. Okay. So words are only 7%. So that's what we understand that. The biggest factor is what you're saying is stage presence is from this. It's 55% is uh, physiology. Okay. Physiology. In other words, your physiology, how you hold yourself, the emotional state that you're in. And this is critical. Because your emotional state sets the state for the audience, okay? And this, this is the mo probably, you know, it is 55% of communication. So just by what state you're in, if you're in a relaxed state, you'll induce the audience into a relaxed state. If you're in an uptight, nervous state, you make the audience nervous, okay? So you are, you jot this down, you, what you are is a state inducer. So before a presentation, now, of course, once you get unconscious competent, then you can just be in a natural state. For, for instance, in the beginning, when I, for many years, I would have to, I'd get nervous before a presentation. I'd have to prepare. Uh, and I think you always want a little, little bit of nerves, uh, unless you do so much of it, it really, uh, it doesn't matter. But um, that creates, sometimes that's handy. It changes your state. It makes you alert. Because if you to be too blasé and in the beginning when you're not good at something, you'll become complacent and then that you can, you can stuff up because you've been too complacent. So you always want to be properly prepared. But for me, because I've done this so often, I can just walk in with a zero preparation and just step up on stage and talk about unlimited topics. Um, but that's because I have a set structure and I have so many things that I can talk about. Uh, and so that can just flow. And that means so my natural state is that I could deliver presentations effectively in just a, any state. Like any natural state, um, but until you get to that point, you or, you know you'll find if some topics right now you could do that in a natural state, without any training. Because if you're passionate about something, you'll just flow. But if it's something you're going to say you've got to present on something that you haven't done before or done often, all of a sudden, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Okay, so that's where preparation, having a PowerPoint backs all that up. So some of you, if you're doing a presentation that you're passionate about, something you love, it's going to be ten times easier. But when you're doing something for the first time, you've got to develop those skills and get practice at it. Okay? So what you want to do is jot this down. Now, some of you have attended 21st Century, attended the full day or on the home study. I talk about the triad, um, you know, what determines your emotional state. And one is your physiology. So how you feel at any given time is your physiology. So what I would do is before a presentation, you want to put yourself in a certain state. Okay? The more natural you get, the more relaxed state you'll be. But you want your state at, at a hyper state to the audience. 
Because if you're going into a cold room, there's two things what will happen. Is the room will induce you into their state or you'll induce the room into your state. And most people, the reason they're not effective at what they do is other people induce them into their state. So if someone's negative, they'll induce you into being negative unless you've got a stronger state. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, you look at Michael Jackson when he was um, good at what he was doing. Okay, and back in his heydays when he was, everyone loved him for his music, etc. Effectively, why was he one of the most successful um, uh, sellers of records in, in the history and CDs in the history of mankind? Is effectively, you think about it, is Michael Jackson um, was a state inducer. So when he would come on stage with Thriller, remember he vented pretty much the video music industry. Before that, there was no video clips. You know, it was like Thriller was the first, was a 13 minute trailer. Where now, like songs, every song has a video clip. You know, it's unheard of not to have a video clip. So he was the first one that brought out. So all of a sudden, you could see him not only s hear him singing, but you could also see him moving and dancing. And he would just induce people into like a, a, a happier state. He was a state inducer. Okay, so effectively, why do people go to concerts? They want to pay to have their state changed. Effectively is what they're paying for. So you, whoever has the strongest state will induce the other person. So whoever is the most certain will um, influence the other person. So that's critical. So what you can do before a presentation is get yourself into state. So I always have a, a ritual that I will do. Okay? And it will depend on the delivery of the, the program as well that I'm delivering. Some events... Um, might be much more high energy and high passion, so I have to put myself in a higher state. Others, I might want to be just very low key. Depends on the audience, the nature, the context, the presentation. Okay, if I'm talking in a board meeting, then I'm in a different state to if I'm talking at a four-day seminar, as an example. Okay, where I'm trying to get people to break the board or something. So you're in a, a very different state. So you've got to know your audience. You also disguise your state too. So you might be really pumped up, excited. Um, but you'll just, you know, you'll just disguise that a little bit, okay? Keep it a little bit low. And your goal for the presentation, if we were to draw... Uh, ..a graph of your presentation, you start your presentation, and the energy's down here, and your goal is to increase the energy in the room of the presentation, uh, and you want to close at the peak, okay? So you increase the energy in your audience, you increase, raise their a commitment, their energy, and that's the presentation. Okay, because if you have a presentation, you might get people really excited; it's going really well. But then 